The woman you see walking in this video is 32-year-old Lorraine Cox. She's visibly inebriated after spending the day at a pub with friends in Exeter, after the bars and clubs in England had recently opened after the long lockdown period. Lorraine was supposed to sleep over at one of her closest friends, but they somehow got separated just before closing time, so she decided to walk to her dad's house, which was less than two miles away. What Lorraine doesn't know is that she's being followed. This man has been tailing her for over a mile now, and he's about to catch up to her very soon, and what would unfold is nothing short of horrific. Lorraine would go missing shortly after this encounter, and nine days later, her dismembered body was discovered scattered across different dump sites in Exeter. The killer had tried to take a number of steps to conceal his shocking crime, but thanks to the extensive network of CCTV cameras in England and the relentless efforts of the investigators, they managed to identify the perpetrator and what unfolded was a chilling and sickening motive behind this heinous act. This is the horrifying true crime story of Lorraine Cox. Lorraine Cox was a warm-hearted and generous young woman from Devon in the UK. Known for her fun-loving and caring nature, she moved to Scotland in 2020 to live with her fiancé during the hard lockdown period. After going through some difficult times and missing the comfort of her friends and family back home, Lorraine decided to move back to Exeter in August 2020. On August 31st, after being back home in Exeter for about two weeks, Lorraine was ready to catch up with some friends after nearly a year of being apart. With bars and pubs reopening in England after the lockdown, they decided to meet at a local bar. The afternoon was filled with laughter, catching up, and enjoying drinks together, no doubt having many fascinating stories to share. As the conversation flowed and the joy of reconnecting took over, time seemed to slip away, and suddenly it was already 1.30 a.m., with the pub about to close its doors shortly. Lorraine had earlier arranged to sleep over at one of her friends, but they somehow got separated just before closing time. Another friend kindly offered to call a taxi for Lorraine, worried about her walking alone at night for the two-mile trip to her father's house in Beacon Heath. However, Lorraine insisted she was okay and decided to walk instead. She said her goodbyes to her friends, completely unaware that this would be their final farewell and they would never see each other again. Over the next couple of days, Lorraine continued to be in contact with her friends and family via text messages, but they couldn't help but notice that something was off. Her responses were unusual and not in line with her usual behavior, and whenever they tried calling her, she avoided answering their calls and chose to reply only through texts. As their concern grew, they started asking more questions, but Lorraine became increasingly evasive. Then, seemingly out of nowhere, Lorraine sent a message to her closest friends and family, claiming she had moved to Plymouth and even updated her location on Facebook. This sudden announcement left her loved ones even more suspicious and perplexed, and they were convinced that something was terribly wrong. Lorraine's dad went around to her place to check up if everything was all right. When he got there, there was no sign of Lorraine, but he did notice something very concerning. All of Lorraine's medication was still there. As a type 1 diabetic, she relied on her insulin medication, and the fact that she didn't take it with her was alarming. Her father was now convinced that foul play was involved, so on September 3, 2020, he went to report Lorraine missing. The police launched an immediate investigation and went to speak to the friends that were out with Lorraine that evening. After hearing that Lorraine had walked home at 1.30 a.m., they decided to turn to CCTV footage to see if they can retrace her steps, and it didn't take them long to spot Lorraine. Shortly after 2 a.m., Lorraine is seen strolling along Exeter High Street, appearing relaxed and unaware of any potential danger. However, police quickly notice a man walking alone not far behind her. It becomes apparent that he's following Lorraine, and he keeps trailing her for over a mile. Lorraine, still unaware that the man is following her, walks casually with her hands in her pockets, making her way to her dad's place in Beacon Heath. Police watch intently as they see the man catching up to Lorraine, still not sure what his intentions were. At some point, Lorraine becomes aware of the man behind her and turns around to have a look at him. It's unclear what they say to each other, but Lorraine decides to cross the road. The man continues to follow her across the road and shortly after that, it seems that they had struck up a conversation. The two are seen walking closely together and the man even puts his arm around Lorraine's shoulder as they appear to head back from where they came. It remains uncertain whether Lorraine is willingly walking with him or if she's being coerced. 
but it's evident that she's unsteady on her feet. Lorraine and the unknown man are observed walking back along the high street before turning into a side road, and from there, the trail goes cold. No other cameras capture Lorraine's movements afterward, so the police realize that the man seen in the footage is crucial to solving the case. Police launched an all-out manhunt trying to locate the unknown man in the footage, and it quickly led them to a residence above a kebab shop just off the high street. They noticed that the unknown man exited this building shortly after Lorraine passed the shop, and he immediately started following Lorraine. Police then went to the residence in question, and here they spoke to a 22-year-old man who identified himself as Christopher Myers. He initially denied ever seeing Lorraine, but armed with the CCTV footage in hand, they immediately arrested him on suspicion of kidnapping, although this charge would quickly change to one of murder. After searching the dumpsters in the alleyway behind his building, police found dismembered body parts which included human arms and legs. This would later be confirmed to that belonging to Lorraine Cox. Police would also find Lorraine's rucksack, clothing, and phone, all scattered across bins in the alley. Lorraine's bank card and driver's license were found in the suspect's kitchen, and her SIM card was found in the drain of the building. The evidence against the suspect was overwhelming, and when police dug a bit deeper, they realized that he had been deceitful about his identity and that his name wasn't Christopher Myers. Realizing that the gig was up, he told police that his real name was Azam Mangori and that he was an Iraqi immigrant. He said he was a gay man who had sought refuge in the United Kingdom, as his identity would have been punishable by death in Iraq. He applied for asylum in 2018 but was rejected, so he made his way to the United Kingdom illegally and arrived in the back of a truck. According to Azam Mangori's account to the police, he claimed that on the night in question, he encountered Lorraine while walking along Exeter's High Street. They struck up a conversation, and he invited her back to his place with the promise of drugs and alcohol. He said that Lorraine happily agreed, and the two made their way back to his flat. He further told police that before they got to the flat, he and Lorraine had consensual sex in one of the alleyways, before providing police with a recording of him and Lorraine in the alleyway, where they appeared to be having consensual sex. He stated that the reason he made the recording was to protect himself should any claims be made against him later. Azam then told police that when they then returned to his flat, he and Lorraine continued drinking some more and listened to music before having sex a few more times. At some point during the evening, Lorraine took out a black substance wrapped in foil and the two of them began to smoke it. He didn't know what the substance was, but it immediately made him dizzy and sick so he went to lie on the bed and passed out. He said that he woke up a while later, and that's when he discovered Lorraine passed out on the floor, and he immediately noticed that she wasn't breathing. Azam told police that he became panicked after checking her pulse, and when he wanted to perform CPR, he began hallucinating and started seeing spiders coming out of her mouth. Overwhelmed by fear and confusion, he grabbed a t-shirt and placed it in her mouth, hoping to stop the spiders from coming out. He said that he then blacked out and hoped that it had all just been a bad dream. Azam said that when he woke up the following day, the harsh reality sunk in, and his life turned into a nightmare. The guilt and fear consumed him, leaving him paralyzed with indecision. He wanted desperately to call the police and confess, but the dread of being charged with murder held him back. He then went into a strange mental state, and he found himself lost in a confusing haze. The line between reality and illusion became blurred, and he struggled to distinguish what was real from what wasn't. He began to experience haunting hallucinations, desperately holding on to the belief that Lorraine would miraculously wake up. He said that even during the gruesome act of dismembering the body, his mind disconnected from reality, and he wasn't aware of what was happening. He said that in his mind he thought that he was chopping up wet tobacco, completely unaware of what was happening around him. The story put forward by Azam Mangori was a strange one indeed, but police were quickly able to point out the inconsistencies in his story, and the evidence started to contradict his version of events. Azam claimed that he and Lorraine had consumed a strange substance at his flat, yet toxicology reports showed no presence of drugs in Lorraine's system. He also said that he had gone into a frenzy of panic after the murder, yet his actions appeared surprisingly composed and calculated. CCTV footage from his building revealed Azam disposing of Lorraine's belongings in the alleyway, while his outward appearance seems to be calm. In other CCTV footage, 
We can also see Azam traveling with a huge backpack while he walks through town to go and dispose of the rest of the body parts. Azam seems pretty calm and calculated in this footage, despite having a dead body in his backpack. Azam also said that while dismembering the body, he thought he was chopping up wet tobacco. Yet an investigation of his phone revealed that in the days leading up to the murder, he had searched up a number of amputation videos, and even looked up how to dig a grave by hand. The courts would later hear that Lorraine's limbs were cut off neatly at the joint, and that Azam even removed a tattoo Lorraine had on her back, all indicative of his precise planning, and making the identification of her body that much harder. Azam also sent videos to his friends a few hours after the murder, where he was listening to music and smoking a hookah pipe, all while Lorraine lay dead just outside the camera's view. In the days following the murder, he was also captured on camera in shops buying supplies to help him dispose of her body, including bin bags, tape, a suitcase, and an air purifier. This definitely didn't seem like the actions of a man in a weird mental state. As the court proceedings continued, Azam Mangori persisted with his version of events, pleading not guilty to murder, but admitting to the illegal disposal of Lorraine's body. However, the state presented a compelling case, painting a different and disturbing picture of the events that unfolded that night. During the trial, the prosecution presented a harrowing narrative of Azam Mangori as a cold and calculated killer. They revealed that on the night of August 31st, Azam had contacted an escort service before wandering through the city center, where he spotted Lorraine, who was visibly intoxicated and vulnerable. Despite Lorraine agreeing to go home with him, it was clear that she was having trouble walking. The prosecution argued that Azam's true motive was to fulfill his disturbing fantasies of murder. They believed he killed her, possibly by choking or suffocating her with her own t-shirt, before he callously proceeded to dismember her body and carefully planned its disposal. Ultimately, Azam Mangori was found guilty of murder, and the court sentenced him to a minimum term of 20 years in prison before being eligible for parole. During the sentencing, the judge condemned Azam's actions, emphasizing that he had taken the life of a bright, vivacious, and intelligent young woman who had her whole life ahead of her.